Yeah, I mean, it all started with the pyramids. And I've always, ever since I was a very, very young boy of probably six or seven years old, I was always fascinated by pyramids. And I was also, you know, as I grew a little bit older, was fascinated by the fact that there's pyramids all over the ancient world. And um, luckily for me, I had a, a mother who, who, you know, understood all this type of stuff and the mystery of it. And she kind of encouraged me to study this type of stuff. And uh, and I really, you know, because I was so fascinated and I kind of excelled and started to learn not just pyramids, but there's a lot of similarities between all of these ancient civilizations. And it started to progress from there, finding all the similarities, asking, you know, why, why, are the, why do these similarities exist? What does it mean? Um, why aren't modern scholars examining the similarities or taking them seriously? similar to the way in which the Victorian scholars studied them, examined them, and took them very seriously. Is there something going on? And it started, sort, of, sort of started to progress from there. Indeed. How, how important has Freemasonry been in your work uh, so far, Richard? You know, Freemasonry is just confirmation for me. Um, you know, one of the things that I discovered, and this was, uh, you know, many years ago, is the triptych, the concept that uh, all the pyramid cultures all built the same temples, all built the same what I call triptych temples, which is, uh, you know, the three doors with the door in the middle being wider and, uh, and taller than the outer two. Um, you know, when I discovered that, I, I knew I was onto something big, and shortly thereafter I learned that there was this, such a thing called the Freemasons. I learned that uh, a lot of their imagery and a lot of their symbolism is taken from ancient cultures all around the world, not just the Egyptians and not just, uh, you know, the Babylonians. And so I knew that there was there was something in there for me, and I knew that, uh, you know, whatever masonry was, it was calling me, it was saying to me, listen, um, this is this is where you should be here because uh, they had the triptych and, and that's something that I found and I knew I was in the right place. Right, really good. We, you know, a little bit later, I want to go into some of the critique, I guess, of Freemasonry and talk about some of the other information out there and how you perceive that. Uh, as you told me earlier, you, you uh, joined Freemasonry about 10 years ago, so, so we can discuss that later. But why don't we kind of lay the groundwork first in, in some of the things that you found? So let's just kind of head straight into the triptych and, and just describe to us what that is, how you stumbled upon it, and, and what the deeper significance of that is. Okay, um, you know, a uh, long, long ago, <laughs> I'm 40 years old now, so I'm, we're talking about uh, 20 years, something like that. You know, I was just fascinated by all these similarities in ancient cultures all around the world. And every time I went to a museum or I went to speak with a scholar or whoever it would be, a historian, I always brought up the similarities and I was always kind of gently patted down to, and told, uh, you're on the wrong track, um, don't study that stuff, it's not really important. Um, you know, people in the past believed that there was a connection, maybe there was an Atlantis type of civilization, that uh, a mother culture that died long ago and that all the world's first cultures or first known cultures were children of this mother culture. But scholars today don't even believe that anymore and it's not a good avenue to study and, and that type of stuff. And I was always fascinated with that type of stuff. And I went, you know, traveling to search for more evidence because I was convinced at a very young age that that's the truth, that there is a reason why all the first cultures built pyramids. There's a reason why all the first cultures um, had solar symbolism. Many of them created mummies. The concept of life after death and the belief in the soul is pretty much universal with all these cultures and a lot more similarities than that. So, you know, I went on, on an adventure and very quickly I found exactly what I was looking for. I found that all of these pyramid cultures all built the same temples and how it's not been, you know, discovered before. I was, I was you know, at a loss to explain um, because to me it was so obvious. And if you look on my website and you look at the book and you look at the work, I show images, I show photos, I show scientific proof um, that the trip was everywhere. And, you know, for example, the Mayan cultures, uh, the Mayan culture, you know, it's not just one or two triptychs, you know, they have dozens and dozens of triptych temples. And we're talking about ruins, you know, we're not talking about something, you know, imagine um, how many they really built. Um, so that's just the ruins that's what's left of their civilization. Yeah. So, you know, the, the concept of the triptych, um, for me, what I what I slowly learned was uh, it, it's a symbol that uh, all the ancient pyramid cultures built triptychs, and little by little I learned that uh, it symbolized the same religion, the same spiritual wisdom for all the cultures. In other words, the Mayans built triptychs, the Egyptians built triptychs, 
Um, and all the ancient cultures pretty much that built pyramids all built triptychs for the same reason. The triptych has the same meaning all around the ancient world. And in a nutshell, it pretty much explains the difference between your physical self and your spiritual self. Your physical self with a lowercase s, the animal you, the part of you that is flesh and blood that will live only a short time that will soon die. And the spiritual you, the capital S self, the part of you that is eternal, that was never born and that will never die. And the idea of the triptych is basically an explanation of who you are, where you came from, where you're going, and what life is about. And um, pretty much it's the outer two doors of the triptych stand for the pairs of opposites, the sun and the moon, the light and the dark, the, the left and the right. And the inner door is, is the center, is your balance point, is your spiritual you, the transcendent you, the capital S you, um, the part that doesn't take, the part of you that doesn't take part in the duality of the material world because you're older than duality. You're, you transcend duality, the real you, the capital S self you, you transcend duality. And the idea of the triptych is to, uh, is to help you find your center, help you find that balance point and help you discover who you really are. So if we were uh, looking at one, how would we recognize that we could be talking about a, a window configuration, a, a door configuration with two smaller uh, on, on the side of a, of a larger one at the center, correct? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, the one in the center can be taller. It's not always taller, but it's usually wider. It usually has some kind of an emphasis on it. And the two on the opposite, uh, the two flanking the center door um, are usually spaced um, equally apart and are usually spaced um, in, in such a way as they look like opposites, whereas the one in the center is obviously in the center. Where the Freemasons came in for me was um, one of the things that I've always been attracted to ever since I was a kid is Gothic cathedrals. I, I, I still am fascinated by them, and I think they're the most, you know, they're the coolest, the most mysterious, the most profound monuments, some of the most uh, profound monuments on the face of the earth, especially the um, you know, the Gothic cathedrals, most of which were built in, in Northern Europe. And <clears throat> I realized that a lot of these, the entrances to the Gothic cathedrals had triptychs. And slowly I started to understand that uh, the, the, the Freemasons, the operative Freemasons, the builders, um, created these Gothic cathedrals, built triptychs at the entrances, and did so because not only did they understand the ancient worldwide triptych religion, but they built these Gothic cathedrals as a landmark, as a preservation in stone of the ancient worldwide universal religion. So that uh, you'll see triptychs in Gothic cathedrals and the entire facade and the entire shape of the cathedral is an explanation and a revelation of what the triptych wisdom is. Have you find, found the same one on, on most uh, lodges that you've been looking at? Also, yeah, in um, you know a lot of these secret societies, like the Freemasons and, and other secret societies as well, that have uh, that have kind of spun off from the Freemasons, like the uh, like the Pythians, like the Knights of Pythias, um, even the Skull and Bones, and uh, and other secret societies like the Odd Fellows. A lot of them, a lot of their uh, lodges and temples have triptych entrances, and you know that that's because these secret societies were founded, okay, founded to preserve the ancient wisdom tradition. Now, is that what they're here for today? No, they have a different purpose today. They, they've, you know, they've digressed, there's, there's a problem. The, the wires have been played with, the wires have been messed with. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something wrong today, and that's happened probably a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but the, um, the creation of these secret societies was originally for a very good purpose. And you got to remember that, uh, you know, Europe, we're, we're talking about Europe and, and Christianity. Christianity ruled over Europe. And, uh, you know, you couldn't really talk against Christianity. So there had to be a way to uh, safely relay the ancient universal religion down the ages. And that's what the secret societies were for. They existed to perpetuate the ancient knowledge. They existed to perpetuate what was once a very fantastic universal religion, a, a tr religion of truth, a spiritual wisdom of truth that's as applicable to our own lives today as it was to the ancients. Um, and that's what secret societies were about. That's why secret societies have triptych facades. That's why the Freemasons and a lot of their lodges and a lot of their buildings built uh, you know, triptychs at their entrances. Um, and Gothic cathedrals have triptych facades. It's all a continuation of the ancient wisdom. 
very interesting. Now, a little bit later, I want to talk about this, how this, how think, things got sidetracked, something has gone wrong, you said. We'll return to that later. But let's zoom in a little bit more on the, uh, on the parent culture then, if you will. I want to ask you a little bit about how advanced you think that it was and, and if it was a global civilization and, and what some of the, uh, what they've helped us to, uh, you know, to, to, to bring basically some of the things that we can see in our world today. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's really something that I, I – honestly, I have no idea. It's, it's something that I just have no idea about. Um, I feel like there was something there. I, I, you know, I, I follow Plato. I follow the classical historians. Um, you know, they, they spoke about Atlantis. They spoke about a, a continent in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean um, and that sank into the sea or that was destroyed by a flood. Um, and the concept of a flood is very important because – all the first known cultures all have that flood myth. So to me, the concept of a flood, which is common to all the first cultures, is relatable, is explaining what happened to Atlantis, is explaining to what happened to this mother culture. Um, and I, I relate it as a golden age civilization. In other words, Atlantis was a mother culture. It was very highly advanced. And um, I don't necessarily mean technologically advanced. I mean, they understood what life was about. They understood the concept of spirituality, the, the difference between the physical body and the spiritual self that I discussed earlier. And, uh, and you know, life for them was, uh, was an initiation into this wisdom. I think that Atlantis lit, existed during what the ancients called the Golden Age. And uh, if you follow, um, you know, classical authors and historians like Hesiod and Ovid, um, you'll know that they talked about different ages of men. And it all started with the Golden Age. Hesiod, Hesiod talks about five ages, the Golden Age, starting with the Golden Age and then coming down from the silver and then the bronze and the heroic and the Iron Age. Ovid also um, similarly talks about ages where it started with the Golden Age and then there was the silver and bronze and then the Iron Age. And and the, in the Hindu Vedic ages or the yugas, um, what they're called, you know, we have the same type of idea. Um, and many people say that today we're living in the Kali Yuga age, which is the, the worst one of all. And so what you have here is a, the concept of a general digression. Um, and that's the exact opposite of what scholars and historians and people today believe. They believe that we started out in the Stone Age and little by little things have gotten better and better. And now here we are today with this fantastically sophisticated culture. No, no, I believe the exact opposite. Um, there was once a fantastically sophisticated culture and little by little we've digressed. And, uh, and today we're in, we're in sheer darkness compared to what, uh, to what the ancients of the Golden Age um, culture, uh, you know, the type of civilization that they lived in and the love that they had for each other and the wisdom um, that marked their day-to-day -day existence. So you don't measure advancement by uh, how, uh, you know, how, how detailed and, and uh, quick our iPads are. You're talking about something completely different here, an understanding of, of, of life and, and nature, uh, human relationships, and also the fact that we uh, seem to have a, a different attitude towards, towards life overall in the past. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, I feel that, you know, the they understood mysteries of the mind like we don't today. They understood um, the the how to how to um, how to explain what a human being is, not just on a spiritual but on a physical level. They understood concepts of astronomy and and the pulls that uh, uh, the gravitational pulls that the different planets have on us and and that type of stuff and. You know, when you are exposed to this and when you have this type of information, um, you know, it's, it's, it signals a much more advanced society than we are today where, you know, if the iPad doesn't work, you bang it and you throw it against the wall because you're so angry. I mean, you're weak. You're, we're, we're weak to do that. We're a weak people. We're, um, I see us today as being very weak. We, we don't control our emotions. We're barbaric. We have wars. We, have, we destroy each other. Um, and uh, we, we control each other. I, I just I see a, a very bad world out there. Um, and when I look to antiquity, I don't see that at all. I see a much um, a much higher higher wisdom at work there. And there is a conflict in history here because what we hear uh, in, in some instances, and again, depends on where you turn to get your information. As always, there's always contradictory data out there. But we hear that the that the pagans were the ones who were barbaric, uh, involved in human sacrifice, and thank God that Christianity arrived on the scene that saved us from all this, right? Yeah, that's what we're taught. You know, we're 
that's exactly what we're taught, you know, exactly that, that, uh, that the pagans were animalistic and, uh, and, you know, practicing witchcraft and the nature religions. We sort of have this, uh, you know, looking down, thumbing our noses down at the nature religions as if they were something beneath us. Um, and I think that uh, the exact opposite is true. You know, once you, once you separate yourself from nature, um, you're sort of a head without a body and you're cutting yourself off from who you really are. A lot of these pagan traditions and a lot of the ancient religions, you know, they told you the answers will be found in nature. The, you know, look to nature to find the answers and, and to find who you are. And that's something that we've distanced ourselves from today. And I think we've had a little help from an unseen invisible college that doesn't really want us to find ourselves, that doesn't really want us to know who we are, because then it's going to be harder to control us. Um, in order to be able to control us, they need us to be scared. They need us to look for look for answers. They need us to be, uh, you know, in fear all the time. And that's that's the way we buy their products, and that's the way we buy into their um, their constant messages of who we are and what we need to purchase to, in order to know who we are and you know, what we need to, what type of politics we need to buy into and all that type of stuff. So I think we've had a little help uh, in the wrong way. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll go into that a little, bit, a little bit later here. Now, to me, Richard, it seems like um, at least one stage, if you will, of this uh, digression, de de degradation that you mentioned before, it seems like that began in association with a major catastrophe or, or a flood that you refer to. It might be, we might be talking about several here, but we know that at least one major one seemed to have taken place at some stage in, in, in the past. And, and this seems to have been a, a problematic uh, in incident, accident, because of, of our relationship changed to nature. But there are some who suggest that the um, that this degradation began before that, that, that there was something within society. If we talk about Atlantis, for example, as a high civilization, there, there's uh, some information that indicates that they became corrupt basically at one stage, and then a little bit later, a, a, a catastrophe or a flood happened. Which, what, what do you think about that? I think exactly what Plato said was correct. And what Plato said when he discussed Atlantis was, and I, I'm just paraphrasing here, but he pretty much said that. Uh, when they ceased to identify with the divine element in themselves, and when they started more to identify with their human nature, with their animal nature, little by little, that caused the downfall. Um, and there's a lot of wisdom in there. I mean, first of all, it teaches that, you know, we have divinity within us. Um, we have eternity within us. We have spirituality within us. We don't we don't need to uh, to you know subscribe to a modern religion in order to to, to find that. Um, so you know that's just one of the many ideas that uh, that that I you know that Plato's um, that Plato speaks to. But uh, you know I, I, he makes it pretty clear that the reason for the downfall was that uh, they ceased. I think that he says something like they ceased to carry their uh, prosperity with moderation or something like this. Um, they stopped. They stopped realizing. They stopped focusing on the divinity within themselves, and they started to get more greedy. They started to get more lustful. They started to get. They started to identify more and more with the material world rather than with the transcendent element within them, which is who they really are. Um, so they lost sight of who they are. They they lost the balance point. They lost the centeredness, um, and that in some way translated to the catastrophe that you know, that uh, that we talk about as the flood and as the destruction of the continent. And and so yet this is the basic message of the symbol itself, the importance of balance between the uh, dichotomy of everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's part of it. Yep, a very strong part of it. That's, the you know, one of the main messages of it is um, don't identify with the duality. Don't identify with the good and the bad. That's, you know, that's part of the world and it's an important part of the world, but that's not who you are. You're something deeper. You're something more ancient. You're something more eternal. Um, and you're something much, much more profound than that. And, uh, and the, and you know, they, they started to identify with the, with the opposites. Whereas the lesson is, is to find the center and transcend the opposites. There's a sun and a moon element in this. And I think that that's really important for, uh, to understand what the triptych is. Um, there's a, there's a, there's, um, 
one side of the one side of the opposite. There's two doors on the outside of the triptych. Um, the right door, the, when you're looking at the triptych, the one on the left, but it's actually the right door, is the or is the door of the sun, um, and the left door is the door of the moon. Um, and that's the sun and the moon are used in Freemasonry and used in a lot of other uh, systems, both ancient and modern. And there's a reason, and that's because the sun and the moon symbolize all the pairs of opposites in the world. The um, during you know you have the sun and the moon, they stand for day and night, obviously, which we perceive as opposites. Um, the sun is out and it's warm um, during the day, and the moon is out and it's cold at night. Um, during the day, things are usually dry because the sun is out, and at night, things are moist. Um, so you have the opposites of, of dry and moist, and obviously light and dark. And so the concept of the sun and the moon are really, really important here. The the right side of the um, triptych, the right hand door of the triptych, is identified with the sun and the male, and the left door of the triptych is the moon and the female. Um, and Again, you know, the idea is not to identify with male or female or right or wrong or sun and moon. It's to find that center point and realize that, uh, you know, you can balance the two and you need to balance the two. And um, in a sense, also that you're the creator of all this. You're the you're the you, you know, you're the source. The sort don't don't go looking for the source in the Bible or some kind of a holy book. You are the source. You are the center point of the triptych, and you are the deity, the eternal soul, the God within um, in the center point of the triptych. There's a triptych in the Last Supper um, right behind Jesus in the middle. In fact, I think the entire Last Supper is all about the triptych. It has nothing really to do with, uh, with Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Last Supper, you have Christ in the center door of the triptych, and then you have the two outer doors. You have six disciples on either side ex explaining the concept of balance. Um, and the idea with Christ being in the middle is, you know, when you put your mind in the middle, you're aligning yourself with that Christ consciousness or with that Buddha consciousness, with that eternal divine self, that capital S U part. Um, and that's the message of the of the Last Supper, which is, you know, uh, identify with the middle. That's who you really are. Don't identify with the, you know, with the right side or the left side. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, now, how far back do we need to go, do you think, to begin to maybe um, come closer to the origins of this knowledge? Again, then, just to reemphasize this, we know that there's been a, a destruction. So the buildings that we see today, uh, including the pyramids and everything else that uh, that are part, if you will, of this ancient system, we don't know if that's the first generation, first version of this. There might have been several more, but they've all been destroyed. But what do you think? How far back do we need to go to begin to get closer to the, the origin point of all this? Yeah, I, I find it in the earliest buildings. Um, you know, usually when we think of ancient civilizations, most of us think of ancient Egypt. It's probably one of the, if not the oldest cultures on Earth. Um, and, you know, scholars are always finding one that's older and, and that type of stuff. And that's going to keep going back and forth for, for decades. But, you know, the ancient Egyptians built a lot of triptych temples. And Almost all the time, the Aten symbol, um, you know, the, the sun disk with the, with the twin serpents issuing from either side and the wings, that's always on the top of the center door of the triptych. And that, that's a symbol of the perfected soul and the, the soul that's been able to, you know, strike that balance of opposites. The two serpents are symbolic of that, as well as the wings. And even on an up and down level, you have, uh, you know, the wings... The wings of the Aten symbolizing something very high up and, and a spiritual transcendence. And whereas the twin serpents, you know, uh, when they're when they're two like that, one's looking to the left and one's looking to the right. They're you know they're symbolic of duality. Um, serpent is something that crawls on the ground as opposed to wings, which are high up in the air. Um, so and then of course a circle with no beginning and no end is a symbol of eternity. Um, and a symbol of the soul, the perfected soul. So, you know, in some of the most ancient temples of Egypt, there's triptychs, and on these triptychs, and above the center door is this Aten symbol, which is telling us, you know, this is the concept of the, the balance of opposites to find the soul within. So, you know, it's it's as old as uh, as civilization goes. Yeah, in, in a world today that is so incredibly polarized and again focused on the left uh, wing of of this animal or the right wing of that animal, it's it's a really important lesson to be able to 
well, both transcend that, of course, but understand that there is a there is a unity in the opposites, if you will, and that they both hold something which is of of, of value, and that we need to find 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 balance between these sides, basically. That's right. I, I love it. You said it perfectly. You know, that's exactly it. There's a, there's a unity in the opposites. I like to think of it as the yin yang symbol. You know, the Tao. Um, you are. It's a symbol of you. All. Everything, by the way, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the reasons people ask me, have you heard of this research or that research? I really don't. I'm, I'm really not interested. I'm, I find that a lot of people are not focused on the right things. All of this stuff, the ancient Egyptians, the Mayans, all the wisdom traditions of the ages, paganism, um, and a lot of the secret societies like the Masons and stuff, the myths, everything is about you. It's about teaching you who you are, teaching you what life is about. You know, it's, it's there to teach us. And a lot of people I don't see, you know, talking about this stuff. And to me, this is the most important thing. You know, this is, you know, this type of stuff for me unites everything that I'm interested in. I'm interested in all the ancient civilizations. I'm interested in all their wisdom. I'm interested in all the similarities between these ancient civilizations. I'm interested in the Greek philosophers and in Hinduism because Hinduism is the oldest living religion. Um, and I'm interested in the secret societies because I know that they're, they, they exist as a, as a continuation of this wisdom. So I don't see anybody else really talking about all this stuff. And, and you know, this is important to me because this is, it's touching on all the stuff I'm interested in. But, uh, but the, you know, getting back to the Tao, for me, the, the, the yin-yang symbol, that's a symbol of us. You know, people see the yin and the yang and they say, well, it's a concept of opposites, but it's more than that. There's actually a third element in play, which is the circle, the circle which, you know, um, encompasses both opposites. The symbol of the yin yang is a symbol of who you are. The circle is a symbol of your eternal soul. It has no beginning and no end. And the yin and the yang are a symbol of the opposites, which is your physical self, the uh, the left side of your body and the right side of your body, which one side is male and one, the other side is female. One side is solar, the other side is lunar. Um, and you'll remember from cartoons when we were a kid, you'd have the the evil demon telling you on the left side, telling you to do bad and tempting you to, to do bad things. And the and the good angel on your right side telling you to do good things. And that's just the, the same concept um, at play here. Uh, you are a yin yang. You are the Tao. You you are an eternal being. You've manifested the opposites. You've manifested your body, just like a snail creates its own shell, and to to live in the material world. Um, and uh, and you won't be here for long. But when you do die, you'll go back to that eternal Tao, that circle, which is who you are. And you've traveled quite a bit as well, and to be able to see uh, much of this for yourself in the temples and everything else, correct? Yeah, I mean, traveling is the best thing in the world. It just opens you up to so much. I have friends that grew, you know, grew up in New York with me, who are, you know, Italian and Irish and things like that, saying, you know, why aren't you Christian? Why, why, you know, what is all this about? And you know, now they understand. But, you know, having not really been exposed to too much else, they're, you know, um, focused on what they're taught. And, and you know, as you know, people are taught different things in different parts of the world. The people in the Middle East wouldn't even think of uh, many people in the Middle East wouldn't even think of of uh, converting from Islam you know people uh, in Christian lands don't understand how people can reject Christ um, so you know traveling really opens up so many doors and and you know it expands your horizons definitely your mind. yeah now uh, one of the biggest no-nos is what you said before it's to begin to uh, point at the similarities between these uh, seemingly different cultures, uh, and this gets into the topic of transcultural diffusion, which I'm a believer of myself as well. And, and uh, the question is, of course, how they, uh, if there was a one source, as we talked about so far, that is the origins of everything, or if there was communication with uh, basically uh, a travel. But in one of your articles, uh, Richard, you basically point out the, the incredible uh, similarities in the cultural uh, cultures of the Egyptians and, and the pre-Incas or, or, or the Mayans or, or on the South American side, we should say. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I'm just fascinated with. And, and all the time I'm finding more and more. Um, and I'll give you one that probably I just I'm just really hitting on right now that I'm going to be talking about in the, in, in the new book, The Secret of a Circle, that I'm writing right now. You know, if you think about the Aten symbol, uh, many people know about it as know it as the circumpunct. Um, it's the hieroglyphic symbol is a circle with a dot in the center. Um, and that's a symbol of the self, the higher self, which is who we are. 
the the Aztec calendar stone has the same exact it's the same exact symbol. Um, it's a circle and it has a dot in the center and in the middle of that is the sun god is a face of the sun god actually. See it's the same exact symbol and it and, and, and as I'm learning now and, and I'm digging more and more into it, um, it means the same exact thing. It's an emblem of who we are. It's a, as I said earlier, it's a explaining the difference between our higher self, the the soul within who we are, the true self, the true you know God within, which is who we are, and the physical animal self. Um, so, you know, finding the similarities. Like uh, I have the latest article up on the website, um, which explains the similarities between the pre-Inca and Inca civilizations in Peru and the ancient Egyptian civilization, these, these two cultures are twin civilizations. And I, I, I would dare any scholar to debate me live on any program on television or in any forum, and I can prove it. It's so easy because there's so many similarities. And most importantly is, you know, all these similarities point to the same wisdom tradition, to the same religion that was held and celebrated by both cultures. And that's to me the the light at the end of the tunnel. Why why show all these similarities? Well, I show them because I'm interested in them because they point to a universal religion that wasn't just held by the pre-Inca, Inca, and Egyptian civilizations, but by all the ancient cultures, the Chinese, the Hindus, um, the Babylonians, all of them, all of them. And if I had the time and the resources and the money. Um, I would be a lot further along than I am now, not complaining because I'm, I'm very happy, you know, to be where I am and to be on the track that I'm on. Um, but there's just so much more out there and it's a shock. It's really a shock how scholars are just, uh, I believe, suppressing the information, whether they're doing it um, consciously or unconsciously or just because they need a job and they don't want to lose their job is another matter. But, uh, but the similarities are there and there's no denying them. And the fact that the, that the Victorian era scholars addressed them and looked at the similarities and talked about the similarities, and not only that, but believed that there was a mother culture because of the similarities. And now scholars are completely silent about it and won't even discuss it. There's something fishy there, man. Yeah. And there's something that needs to be attacked. And I'm, you know, doing the best I can to attack it. Now, we had an interesting well, pause, shall we say, in human history when things begin to to fall apart almost completely. The the so-called dark ages, the bubonic plague, plague, starvation, uh, uh, loss of knowledge. And I want to kind of uh, get your take on how you think that this happened and and what part of this that you consider to be a, a conspiracy to to I guess suppress mankind and the fact that there seems to be a kind of a reboot in history, even the fact that we begin over with the birth of Christ at, at zero is an obvious sign of this, that someone wants to push the reset button right here. And they've done this, in my view, very, very, very cleverly uh, with with the aid of, of taking away this knowledge and also at the same time demonizing much of this uh, ancient knowledge and calling it witchcraft. And we've had a, a, a tremendous suppression of, of so many different people and their teachings after that. How did this happen, do you think? Yeah, me and you, we're right on the same page there. You know, you have, it's very simple. I I see it as being very simple. You know, you have uh, flourishing civilizations in Europe. Um, You know, you have uh, um, really, really flourishing civilizations. You know, all of a sudden you have Christianity and boom, you know, you're in the dark ages. Um, And they didn't just last for a century or two. They, They lasted for quite a while. I think that what happened was was the concept, you know, of Christianity is 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 they tweaked it slightly, but when they tweaked it, they took away the entire meaning. And all it really, all they really have to, all you really have to do with Christianity to to make sense of it, or at least this is, you know, for me, I'm I'm not preaching to anybody. This is just my own, you know, um, my own view, and this has helped me a lot. Is, uh, you know. Th- there isn't a Jesus, there, there isn't that guy over there that you should worship and, and ask for his help and talk about him. You know, that's where, that's where we've gone wrong. We all have a Christ within. We all have a Buddha within. We all have that God self, that higher S self. We all have that eternal soul within. And I just used a lot of different words to describe it. And it's your source. You know, it's the Christ within. It's the God within. It's the higher self within. It's the... It's the real you, the part of you that was never born and that will never die. That's your Christ self. Now, Jesus was one guy who found his Christ self. 
um, just like uh, Buddha found his Buddha nature. Um, he's the one who woke up, the one who awakened to his Buddha nature. Jesus is the one to, who awakened to his Christ nature. And the message is the message that the ancients knew that we no longer have today is this is in everybody. It's not just for Jesus and it's not just for that guy named Buddha. It's all of us. We must all awaken to our true inner self, to our, which is who we really are. And when we do that, life takes on a whole new meaning. Um, and so the idea was was to take that away from people and to tell them, listen, you don't have a soul. You don't have a Christ nature. In order for you to reach the transcendent, you need to come through us and we're the church. And that's a really powerful way to scare the hell out of people and to make them follow you and to make them listen to everything you say. Because the other alternative is they teach you that you'll go to hell um, and you'll burn for the rest of eternity. And, and people really believe that. Um, they believe that if they were outlawed from the church and they didn't follow the teachings of the church and they didn't follow Jesus, that they would be um, cast down to eternity into hell uh, for the rest of eternity and they would burn forever. And that's the, uh, that's the way that they gained dominion and, and control over, over pretty much all of Europe and then later it sp spread to uh, you know, North and South America. And it's still happening today. And I, I still get emails all the time from Christians telling me why you know, you're, you're on the wrong track and, and this type of stuff. And hey, I'm not trying to take away anybody's religion. I'm just explaining what my path is, what I see for myself. And, and a lot of people are responding to that and saying that uh, they feel the same thing. And, and then we have a, an interesting period here as well. And I mean, there's debate even obviously when exactly to place uh, the Dark Ages, how much you include of that. Some bring it as far back as the 6th century and all the way up to the uh, 13th or even 15th. Uh, but then here towards, well, I guess the middle of that, then we could say uh, we have this period of, of the Gothic cathedrals, which is... As well, then, this is within the context of Christianity that, that, that this is being done, where we see, a, I would call it an, a revival of the, this knowledge. How do we explain that? Is, that? is that Christianity behind that? Who's behind this? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Um, you know, usually scholars, and I think if you go to Wikipedia, you'll see that uh, the explanation of the Dark Ages is from something like the 5th century to all the way up to the Renaissance in the, in the 14th or 15th centuries. But uh, but you're exactly right. I mean, you know, the Gothic cathedrals just fell from the sky, it seems, um, you know, in the in the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. Um, and that'll change, you know, give or take, depending on who you ask, like you say. Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden we have these magnificent Gothic cathedrals and, and really Gothic cathedrals are really magnificent. I've always been drawn to them ever since I'm a kid. Um, you know, I think everybody, you know, looking at a Gothic cathedral is in awe by them, um, by the look of them, the, by the feel, by the, the, by the way they make you feel. Um, where did they come from? You know, how, how did they how did they get to be where they are? I don't have the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I have an idea of what happened. And what seems to me is that you have uh, this, you know, this, this religion of Christianity that uh, that started to take hold and, and gain a very strong foothold, let's say around 300 A.D., um, so that uh, by 400, 500 A.D., um, Christianity is in full swing and the Dark Ages are in full swing also, which which should tell you something about, you know, the impact that Christianity has had in Europe. Probably about uh, 500 years later is when the first Gothic cathedral started to spring up. Now, there has to be a connection then between the, uh, the people who wanted to keep the ancient wisdom tradition alive and the Freemasons. Now, maybe it's true that the Freemasons started right then and there when Christianity arose. I'm not really sure. There's not really a lot of evidence of that. Um, but what there is evidence of is that these Gothic cathedrals um, are, are sort of coming out of nowhere. And many of them have triptych facades, just like the ancient uh, triptych temples of the of the uh, of the Egyptians and of all these ancient cultures that you know that Christianity arose to sort of conquer. Yeah. Uh, so there's a connection there. And another thing that's interesting too is Gnosticism, Gnostics. Um, I think there's that might be the missing link 
Um, the Gnostic tradition, of course, is in agreement with what I said about Christianity, about uh, the, there being a Christ within. Um, you know, Gnosticism teaches that uh, in order to find the eternal life, you know, what, what we're living in here is actually death. And the only real eternal life is the life of the transcendent that you find within. Um, and that's sort of a negative view about it. I like to think of, uh, of it a little bit in a lot more positive terms, but, but the concept is there. The concept of duality is, is, is popular among the Gnostics. And, um, and there's, a, there's a strong link made by scholars between the Gnostics um, you know, the, in early Christianity and, um, and some of the later, uh, later secret societies like the Freemasons. What do you think about the idea that, well, as I said before, we, we, the, in, in history, then it's been a lot of, of things have been taken away. We lose this connectivity between the cultures. Lots of knowledge overall is suppressed. It's deemed as heretical of the devil, etc. And then, interestingly, at the same time, then we have the building of these cathedrals, or, or shortly thereafter, and and they're using now then the same methods. Well, basically, with the triptych and 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 many of the other architectural, uh, you know, magnificent. Uh, properties that we used in the in, in the gothic cathedrals to to in well in my view then strengthen christianity even even further to a certain degree it's like they've used the ancient knowledge but to hardly even repackage it but they're reselling it but in a new context what do you think about that idea um i i think the, in order in order for me to believe that though um i would have to think then that the builders of the Gothic cathedrals were doing it for the purpose of enslaving the masses rather than inspiring and illuminating the masses. And I don't believe that's true. I believe that because I look at the cathedrals and I see a thing of beauty and I see something that's helped awaken me in my life and I know has awakened a lot of other people. Um, so in order to believe that, I would have to believe that the, that the builders of the cathedrals were actually doing it for nefarious purposes. Um, and I don't believe that. I believe that the, the builders of the cathedrals were doing it because they they wanted to continue the ancient wisdom tradition. They wanted there to be a way for later generations like us to understand what the ancient universal wisdom was all about. And they knew that um, building something as massive as a cathedral in s stone um, – would not be easily taken down. You know, if you can burn books, sure, yeah, you can hide manuscripts, you can you can wipe out villages of people, you can destroy a lot. But bringing down Gothic cathedrals is is a tough thing. And I think that uh, I think it, they they knew what they were doing. I think that uh, the Freemasons, the operative Freemasons, built the Gothic cathedrals. You know, on the one hand, they had to satisfy their um, the people who commissioned them, the church. They had to uh, they had to create something that the church would look at and say, "Hi, ah, you did a good job. This is a a great cathedral. This is a great place of worship." And on the other hand, they had to encode uh, the wisdom of the ages, the ancient wisdom tradition, in the architecture in such a way as not to alert anybody, any of the, the church leaders mm -hmm. as to what they were doing. Right. Um, so they had to balance it. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, they say, well, maybe some of the church leaders were complicit. Maybe some of the, you know, maybe some of the church leaders were sort of a fifth column and, and wanted also to preserve this wisdom in stone. And I agree with that, too. Um, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, there were, there were a lot of, of the church leaders who understood what was happening and thought it was a great thing. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times, a lot of, uh, a lot of leaders, uh, they look at the masses and they say, "Oh, well, you know, we need, we need to help them and just give them a very basic set of rules." And Christianity does that. You know, don't kill, don't steal, be nice to your fellow man, and, and they're not prepared yet for the higher wisdom, um, so they sort of turn a blind eye to it. But, you know, I, I, I see the, I see the Gothic cathedrals as as being um, testaments in stone to the ancient universal religion. And I see them as having been built for very positive purposes and to preserve forever the ancient wisdom tradition and the concept of the triptych and the higher self versus the lower self and all that type of stuff, the balance of the opposites and, and you know, the reconciliation and the realization of the transcendent within us. Certainly, they, some people have called them libraries in, in, in stone, and when you look at some of these buildings, I would, uh, I would definitely agree with that. And I just find it interesting that this kind of 
w- there is a, a an internal struggle, I guess, within the history of, of of Europe during this time, and that's why I'm trying to get closer to what really happened and who's in control here, in a sense. Because if we look at the Renaissance, much of the artwork that's coming out of that has biblical imagery within it, but they contained also so-called heretical themes from the Corpus you know, Hermetica when these ideas are begin to being brought back to life again. So it, it contains both, and they managed to put out new or so-called new ideas, these are ancient ideas, but have it still within the context of, of biblical themes. So it's uh, kind of interesting how they pull that off, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. I mean, look, again, look at the Last Supper, okay? Even to this day, everybody says, oh, what a magnificent you know, piece of artwork. The, uh, you know, da Vinci did so much for Christianity with this portrait. You have Christians all over the world who, who have this portrait in their, in their dining rooms and up on the wall, and they think it's a magnificent piece of art, which it is. And most people don't realize that, you know, or at least I'm, I feel very, very strongly that it's an expression of the ancient universal religion because it has the triptych there in the background. It's a, it's a revelation of what the triptych wisdom teaches because it has Christ framed in the middle of the triptych, which teaches us that we all have that Christ within us. And this, all we have to do is find our center between opposites. And I think also, Henrik, that this is, this is interesting too. You can also look at it and say, um, you know, because in the portrait, Jesus is in front of the triptych, almost kind of like saying, it's almost kind of like Da Vinci, I think, was almost saying that the religion of Christianity is in the foreground. Um, but if you look at the background, there's that triptych. So it's almost like saying that the that the Christian religion has stood in the way of the triptych religion of times past. Um, and that you can interpret Christianity in the context of the ancient universal religion by realizing that there wasn't just one Christ, that we're all Christs, and that the goal of you know the goal of life is to is to sort of find that find that being within, find that uh, higher self within, which is who we really are. So I mean that that I totally agree with you. It's it's a it's a balancing act, but I think it's definitely doable. And I think that looking at the Last Supper, it just tells you that hey, it's still being done today. You know. Indeed, I want to take a break here in a little bit, but one more thing we could. Uh, briefly talk about it, and then we can get into more detail about this. But the uh, the Knights Templar, basically predecessors to the Masons, what do they bring to the table? Are they this one and the same when it comes to uh, being part of the building of the cathedrals? You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I've always kind of been turned off by the, the whole concept of the Knights Templars and any research involved in the Knights Templars. I know it's popular. I know a lot of people in you know love the idea. To me, there's very little documentation about the Knights Templar. Um, they didn't really leave buildings. They didn't really leave too much that I can actually study and get, you know, get my sink my teeth into, like the Freemasons did, like with the Gothic cathedrals. And of course, there'll be a group of people that say, "Oh, the, there's nothing that links the operative Freemasons to the Gothic cathedrals," and I think that's just a bunch of nonsense and hogwash. And he'll never convince me of that. Um, but Knights Templar is not something that I, I would say that I'm. I have any any kind of uh, um, you know knowledge about or, or, or re- have done any significant amount of research into. I know a lot of people have, and I've read a lot about. You know, I've read some about the Knights Templars, but I've never really been able to 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 link them up in a way that I feel confident in, in publishing something about them, linking them to either the ancient wisdom tradition or the Freemasons. All right, uh, Richard, let's just talk a little bit here about your, your books. And of course, uh, first one, Written in Stone, Decoding the Secret Masonic Religion, Hidden in Gothic Cathedrals and World Architecture. That's out now and available. And then, of course, you have uh, an upcoming one, a Secret of the Circle or the Lost Ancient Secret of the Circle. Uh, tell us just briefly about that and when that will be available, Richard. Okay, I'm actually working on it right now. And, and um The concept is really about how if you look at the world's most ancient um, wisdom traditions and and cultures and things like that, their most important symbols were circular. Um, And I'll just use the the Aten from Egypt, which is the circle with the dot in the center, which we talked about earlier, the the sun disk with the the wings and the serpents issuing. Um, In Egypt, that's that's a circle. I mean, that's that that was probably along with the Ankh, one of their most important symbols. That's a symbol of the soul. 
Um, we have the same symbol in um, in the Aztec culture. It's the um, and we talked about that also. The Aztec calendar stone. Um, it's a symbol also of the soul, and um, and there's a lot of similarities there. Um, look at the Tao in China, the yin yang symbol. It's circular, um, and a lot of the um, ancient cultures in uh, in in that you know today we look at the ancient um, the American Indians also had um, a lot of uh, circle symbols in their culture. Um, the Chinese mandala, things like that, the uh, the mandalas that uh, that were created by different people. Um, look at the flag of India. It has uh, it has a circular symbol on it that's very similar similar to the Aten. All these cultures use the same symbol, use the Aten symbol, use the sun symbol. It's uh, it's a symbol of the soul. It's a symbol of the self, um, of the higher self, capital S self. Um, and it also explains who we are in terms of the difference between the higher self and the lower self. The lower self being the physical animal self, the body self, which is who we think we are. Um, but the real self is the, the transcendent higher self within us, the spiritual self. So, you know, the first part of the book sort of goes around the world and shows how, you know, all of these um, ancient civilizations had the same circle as the you know pinnacle symbol of their culture and because they all understood that you know uh, the same wisdom tradition which is you know we're all uh, we're all composed of an eternal soul and, and god within or christ within or buddha within and then the second part shows how um the circle has been taken and used by a lot of these big corporations that uh, that today run the world um and they're being used against us they're being used to entice us to buy their products, to entice us to be attracted to their logos, to be attracted to who they are, to find, because there's a deeper part of us when when we see the circle as an unconscious part of us, when we see the circle, we identify with that, whether we realize it or not. Um, you know, Carl Jung called it the, uh, the collective unconscious, that uh, there's a part of every one of us that, um, that is the same, we're all human beings. And we all and there's a, there's a memory within us of, of these circular symbols that we are not even aware of because whether we've had a personal experience with them or not, there's it's built into our DNA, if you will, um, and we don't realize it. But these big corporations know it well. Um, and if you look at uh, pretty much all the uh, the major corporations, they use the circle either in their logos or in their advertising, and they use it in such a way they use it in the right way, which is the uh, you know, explaining that the circle is uh, is symbolic of the sun, and uh, usually having a point right in the middle of it, um, and, and so the book so, sort of explains that. Uh, you know, shows the similarity of the circle in ancient civilizations, and then shows how a lot of these modern corporations have stolen this wisdom, and rather than sharing the wisdom with the masses and explaining um, it to us and explaining this is who you really are and and this is what it's about, they're using it to control us. And we are controlled. Most of us are, are very severely controlled. Even though even those of us who who realize that the game is rigged and the table is tilted, even all even us, we're still attracted to that circle, whether we realize it or not. We're still under control because of that circle symbol. So give us your website so our listeners know where to go to find out more, obviously, about you, your work, and uh, pick up copies of your books, Richard. Okay, I have uh, you know the book website is deepertruth.com. Um, and I have a series of articles that explain the triptych and uh, and its manifestation in antiquity and in some of the modern buildings and secret societies and things like that in Gothic cathedrals. And I'm constantly updating that website. And I also have a, a blog website called richardcasaro.com where I, I pretty much talk about the triptych and a lot of other things that I find interesting like, uh, um, you know, the, the, the degree to which uh, ancient wisdom is being suppressed. Um, the fact that we're enslaved by these big corporations and who who own and control most of the governments and, you know, what it's all about, the, the, the big 500 families behind them or a thousand families behind them and um, and pretty much anything that I find interesting and anything that I want to write about. So DeeperTruth.com for the book Written in Stone and RichardCasaro.com for pretty much all things, you know, mystical, spiritual, archaeological and, uh, and ancient. 
Very good. We'll have the links up on redeyescreations.com as well. And uh, then when we return after the break, we'll talk more about the, this corporate hijacking, if you will, of the symbolism. As Richard uh, mentioned, I'll also ask more about Freemasonry uh, as it's been accused of being a, a network, if you will, for some of the conspirators as well. So there's more interesting points coming up here. So stay with us. We'll uh, tune into some music right here, but we'll be right back with more. Yeah, I mean, it all started with the pyramids. And I've always, ever since I was a very, very young boy of probably six or seven years old, I was always fascinated by pyramids. And I was also, you know, as I grew a little bit older, was fascinated by the fact that there's pyramids all over the ancient world. And um, luckily for me, I had a, a mother who, who, you know, understood all this type of stuff and the mystery of it. And she kind of encouraged me to study this type of stuff and uh, and I really you know because I was so fascinated and I kind of excelled and started to learn not just pyramids but there's a lot of similarities between all of these ancient civilizations and it started to progress from there finding all the similarities asking you know what why are the what do these similarities exist what does it mean um, why aren't modern scholars examining the similarities or taking them seriously similar to the way in which the Victorian scholars studied them, examined them, and took them very seriously. Is there something going on? And it sort of, sort of, sort of started to progress from there. Indeed. How, how important has Freemasonry been in your work uh, so far, Richard? You know, Freemasonry is just confirmation for me. Um, you know, one of the things that I discovered, and this was, uh, you know, many years ago, is the triptych, the concept that uh, all the pyramid cultures all built the same temples, all built the same what I call triptych temples, which is, uh, you know, the three doors with the door in the middle being wider and, uh, and taller than the outer two. Um, you know, when I discovered that, I, I knew I was onto something big. And shortly thereafter, I learned that there was this, such a thing called the Freemasons. I learned that uh, a lot of their imagery and a lot of their symbolism is taken from ancient cultures all around the world, not just the Egyptians and not just, uh, you know, the Babylonians. And so I knew that there was there was something in there for me. And I knew that, uh, you know, whatever masonry was, it was calling me. It was saying to me, listen. Um, this is this is where you should be here because uh, they had the triptych and, and that's something that I found and I knew I was in the right place. Right, really good. We, you know, a little bit later, I want to go into some of the critique, I guess, of Freemasonry. Talk about some of the other information out there and how you perceive that. ...of triptych temples. And we're talking about ruins. You know, we're not talking about something, you know, imagine um, how many they really built. Um, so that's just the ruins that's what's left of their civilization. Yeah. So, you know, the, the concept of the triptych... Um, for me, what I what I slowly learned was uh, it, it's a symbol that uh, all the ancient pyramid cultures built triptychs, and little by little I learned that uh, it symbolized the same religion, the same spiritual wisdom for all the cultures. In other words, the Mayans built triptychs, the Egyptians built triptychs, um, and all the ancient cultures pretty much that built pyramids all built triptychs for the same reason. The triptych has the same meaning all around the ancient world. And in a nutshell, it's pretty much explains the difference between your physical self and your spiritual self. Your physical self with a lowercase s, the animal you, the part of you that is flesh and blood that will live only a short time that will soon die. And the spiritual you, the capital S self, the part of you that is eternal, that was never born and that will never die. And the idea of the triptych is basically an explanation of who you are, where you came from, where you're going, and what life is about. And um, pretty much it's the outer two doors of the triptych stand for the pairs of opposites, the sun and the moon, the light and the dark, the, the left and the right. And the inner door is, is the center, is your balance point, is your spiritual you, the transcendent you, the capital S you, um, the part that doesn't take, the part of you that doesn't take part in the duality of the material world because you're older than duality. You're, you transcend duality, the real you, the capital S self you, you transcend duality. And the idea of the triptych is to, uh, is to help you find your center, help you find that balance point and help you discover who you really are. So if we were uh, looking at one, how would we recognize that we could be talking about a, a window configuration, a, a door configuration with two smaller uh, on, on the side of a, of a larger one at the center, correct? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, the one in the center can be tall. They have a different purpose today. They, they've, you know, they've digressed. There's, there's a problem. The, the wires have been played with. The wires have been messed with. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something wrong today, and that's happened probably a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but 
the um, the creation of these secret societies was originally for a very good purpose. And you got to remember that uh, you know Europe. We're, we're talking about Europe and, and Christianity. Christianity ruled over Europe, and uh, you know you couldn't really talk against Christianity. So there had to be a way to uh, safely relay the ancient universal religion down the ages. And that's what the secret societies were for. They existed to perpetuate the ancient knowledge. They existed to perpetuate what was once a very fantastic universal religion, a, a tr religion of truth, a spiritual wisdom of truth that's as applicable to our own lives today as it was to the ancients. Um, and that's what secret societies were about. That's why secret societies have triptych facades. That's why the Freemasons and a lot of their lodges and a lot of their buildings built uh, you know, triptychs at their entrances. Um, and Gothic cathedrals have triptych facades. It's all a continuation of the ancient wisdom. Very interesting. Now, a little bit later, I want to talk about this, how this how thing, things got sidetracked. Something has gone wrong, you said. We'll return to that later. But let's zoom in a little bit more on the, uh, on the parent culture then, if you will. I want to ask you a little bit about how advanced you think that it was and, and if it was a global civilization and, and what, some of the, uh, what they've helped us to, uh, you know, to, to, to bring basically some of the things that we can see in our world today. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's really something that I, I – honestly, I have no idea. It's, it's something that I just have no idea about. Um, I feel like there was something there. I, I, you know, I, I follow Plato. I follow the classical historians. Um, you know, they, they spoke about Atlantis. They spoke about a, a continent in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean um, and that sank into the sea or that was destroyed by a flood. Um, and the concept of a flood is very important because – all the first known cultures all have that flood myth. So to me, the concept of a flood, which is common to all the first cultures, it's not always taller, but it's usually wider. It usually has some kind of an emphasis on it. And the two on the opposite, uh, the two flanking the center door um, are usually spaced um, equally apart and are usually spaced um, you know, in such a way as they look like opposites, whereas the one in the center is obviously in the center. Where the Freemasons came in for me was um, one of the things that I've always been attracted to ever since I was a kid is Gothic cathedrals. I, I, I still am fascinated by them, and I think they're the most, you know, they're the coolest, the most mysterious, the most profound monuments, some of the most uh, profound monuments on the face of the earth, especially the, um, you know, the Gothic cathedrals, most of which were built in, in Northern Europe. And <clears throat> I realized that a lot of these, the entrances to the Gothic cathedrals had triptychs. And slowly I started to understand that uh, the, the, the Freemasons, the operative Freemasons, the builders um, created these Gothic cathedrals, built triptychs at the entrances and did so because not only did they understand the ancient worldwide triptych religion, but they built these Gothic cathedrals as a landmark, as a preservation in stone of the ancient worldwide universal religion so that uh, you'll see triptychs in Gothic cathedrals and the entire facade and the entire shape of the cathedral is an explanation and a revelation of what the triptych wisdom is. Have you find, found the same one on, on most uh, lodges that you've been looking at? Also, yeah, in um, you know, a lot of these secret societies like the Freemasons and, and other secret societies as well that have... Uh, that have kind of spun off from the Freemasons, like the uh, like the Pythians, like the Knights of Pythias, um, even the Skull and Bones, and uh, and other secret societies like the Odd Fellows. A lot of them, a lot of their uh, lodges and temples have triptych entrances, and you know that that's because these secret societies were founded, okay, founded to preserve the ancient wisdom tradition. Now. Is that what they're here for today? No. Uh, as you told me earlier, you, you uh, joined Freemason about 10 years ago, so, so we can discuss that later. But why don't we kind of lay the groundwork first in, in some of the things that you found? So let's just kind of head straight into the triptych and, and just describe to us what that is, how you stumbled upon it, and, and what the deeper significance of that is. Okay. Um, you know, a long, long ago, <laughs> I'm 40 years old now, so we're talking about uh, 20 years, something like that. You know, I was just fascinated by all these similarities in ancient cultures all around the world. And every time I went to a museum or I went to speak with a scholar or whoever it would be, a historian, I always brought up the similarities and I was always kind of gently patted down to, and told, uh, you're on the wrong track, um, don't study that stuff, it's not really important. 
um, you know, people in the past believed that there was a connection. Maybe there was an Atlantis type of civilization that uh, a mother culture that died long ago and that all the world's first cultures or first known cultures were children of this mother culture. But scholars today don't even believe that anymore. And it's not a good avenue to study and, and that type of stuff. And I was always fascinated with that type of stuff. And I went, you know, traveling to search for more evidence because I was convinced at a very young age that that's the truth, that there is a reason why all the first cultures built pyramids. There's a reason why all the first cultures um, had solar symbolism. Many of them created mummies. The concept of life after death and the belief in the soul is pretty much universal with all these cultures and a lot more similarities than that. So, you know, I went on, on an adventure and very quickly I found exactly what I was looking for. I found that all of these pyramid cultures all built the same temples and how it's not been, you know, discovered before. I was, I was you know, at a loss to explain um, because to me it was so obvious. And if you look on my website and you look at the book and you look at the work, I show images, I show photos, I show scientific proof um, that the trip was everywhere. And, you know, for example, the Mayan cultures, uh, the Mayan culture, you know, it's not just one or two triptychs, you know, they have dozens and dozens